In this series of videos, we're going to be looking at complex variables and how we as scientists and engineers can use this theory to expand the range and types of problems that we can solve in the applications that we're interested in. In chapter one, we're going to essentially revisit arithmetic, algebra, trigonometry, and calculus from the point of view of complex variables and complex functions to see how it's the same and how it's different from the real analysis that we're familiar with. And then in the second chapter, we're going to take a look at conformal mapping and how we can use that framework to help us solve boundary value problems, specifically Laplace's equation, which is a partial differential equation that governs a number of very interesting phenomena throughout science and engineering. So in this video, we're going to introduce complex variables as well as go over some of the definitions that we'll be using throughout the next several videos. So complex variables is a topic that's very similar for us scientists and engineers to matrices and linear algebra in the sense that while we may not have had a formal course in those topics, we've been exposed to them in some way throughout our science and engineering and, and math courses as well. So what I want to do is consolidate some of that information and knowledge and extend it uh, so that we can see how it's useful in a number of different applications of interest to us. Now let me first address some misconceptions about complex variables and the imaginary number. One of the main misconceptions, of course, comes from the name imaginary number. There's nothing imaginary about i, the square root of minus 1. That's an unfortunate nomenclature that's been given to us by people many, many years ago who thought there was really no use for this mathematics. They're, in a sense, making fun of this mathematics. Well, now we can see how useful it is, but unfortunately the name is stuck. So i is the imaginary number, even though there's nothing imaginary about it, per se. So in my first point here, I'm saying there's really nothing imaginary about the imaginary number. In other words, taking the square root of minus 1 is not fundamentally any different than taking the square root of 4. So we all know square root of 4 is plus and minus 2. That doesn't bother us. It never has because it's a real number. But if I put a negative number in there, like square root of minus 1, well, it happens to give me an imaginary result. But from the point of view of the square root as an operator, there's no reason to think it should be fundamentally different if I put in a negative number versus a positive number. Likewise, if you think of factoring, so if we were to factor z squared plus 1 versus z squared minus 1, it's just a difference in sign. Why would that make any difference in how we or whether we even can do this factoring? So z squared minus 1, well that's z plus 1 times z minus 1. Doesn't bother us. Everything is real. On the other hand, if I have a plus sign, so z squared plus 1, well then that factors into z plus the square root of minus 1 times z minus the square root of minus 1, which is z plus i times z minus i. So again, similar to the square root, the fact that this result gives me factors involving all real variables and numbers, whereas this one gives me imaginary numbers, shouldn't be fundamentally different in any way. It just happens to be an imaginary number. Now another misconception has actually been propagated by most of our calculators. If I put in a negative number and I hit the log button, usually it gives an error. It says it doesn't exist. Well, it does exist. It's just that it so happens to be a complex number. So once again, I should be able to put any number into the logarithm as an operator and get a result back. The fact that we were told that logs only exist for positive real numbers, that's just because those are the ones that give us real results. But there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to put any other number in there as well. I just so happen to get a complex result. Here's another way to think about how complex variable theory is going to help us as scientists and engineers extend and expand the types of problems that we can solve. So let me frame it in this way. With respect to complex variables, there's essentially three types of problems, or three classes of problems. The first is where we're given a real problem, and by real I mean that in both senses. So it is a real problem. I can go to the store, I can buy the parts, I can bring them home and build this system and test it. So it's a real system in that sense. It's also real in the sense that it, it can be described by numerically real numbers, variables, and functions. So it's a real problem. You solve it, and at every stage along the way, you have real intermediate steps, and the end result gives you a real solution. That's the vast majority of problems that we've seen thus far in our academic careers in science and engineering, mostly because we as professors have limited the types of problems that we've exposed you to such that they fit into this category. You may have seen some situations where you start off with the real problem, again, 
real in both senses, but there are some complex intermediate steps. So you get some complex numbers, complex variables, complex functions, but somehow magically in the end, you end up with a solution that is all written in terms of real numbers, functions, and so on. If you watch the videos on matrices, you'll remember the spring mass example that we did there. That's an example of that. It's a real system. The system mathematically can be represented in terms of real numbers and variables and functions and, and differential equations. But in order to solve it, we ended up getting some complex numbers along the way. But in the end, we ended up with the real solution that showed the oscillatory behavior of the spring mass system. And you may have seen other examples similar to that. But there's a third class of problems where you start off with the real problem. You notice you always start off with the real problem. We start off with the real problem. You have complex intermediate steps, but you end up with a complex solution. However, the real part of that complex solution, which is real, has physical meaning. And the imaginary part of that complex result, which itself is real, also may have some physical meaning. So in that way, we're using the power of complex variable theory as a tool in our mathematical toolbox to solve a new class of problems, different types of problems, that's going to, again, expand the types of situations that we can address using these methods. So this is going to be illustrated very shortly uh, in the form of harmonic functions. So we'll see where these harmonic functions come from mathematically. We'll see what they represent physically. And that's where this marriage between the applications and complex variable theory is going to be uh, most evident. So the point here is by looking at complex variable theory more in depth than we have before, it's going to enable us to take on these type 2 and type 3 problems and not just be limited to the little corner of the sandbox of type 1 problems. Now this statement here at the end, we no longer live in a positive integer world. What I'm referring to there is, is if I happen to be a sheep herder, right? So every morning I send out my sheep, every evening I, I count them as they come back. Well, I would live in a positive integer world. I have no need for negative numbers because there's no negative sheep. And hopefully I'm not getting fractional sheep back in the evening. So I don't even need fractions. So I live in a positive integer world. That's the only mathematics that I need in order for me to do my job, live my life. Well, we no longer live in a positive integer world. And there was a time they made fun of people doing complex variable theory because they saw no need for it. And they, they ridiculed it. And that's where the name imaginary number came from. Oh, sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure how my vacation photos got in here. Well, since it's here, so this is Lake Louise. This is in the Canadian Rockies, Banff National Park. It's, uh, it's in my mind, in terms of natural beauty, the most uh, beautiful place that I've ever been in the world. So that's Lake Louise, uh, just outside of Banff. Okay, so let's talk about some definitions. Some of these will be familiar to you, but let's all put it all in one place so we can uh, have a common set of vocabulary. So we're going to be looking at complex numbers, complex variables, and complex functions throughout the next several sections. So a complex number is simply of this form. So say alpha is a complex number. It's a plus i, b. So a and b are real numbers. And a is the real part of our complex number alpha. And b, which itself is real, is the imaginary part of our complex number i is such that i squared is equal to minus 1. So i is the square root of minus 1. The notation we use that a is the real part of alpha, or re of alpha, and b is the imaginary part of alpha, or im of alpha. A complex variable is similar. The generic complex variable that we'll use is z, and the real part will be x, and the imaginary part will be y. So z is x plus i, y will be our generic independent variable that we'll use throughout complex variable theory. <laughs> Sorry again, so here's, here's another picture of Lake Louise. This, this is the actual lake here, it's frozen over. Uh, here's Victoria Glacier. This is a very beautiful location. Uh, in fact, just to my left where I took this picture is a, uh, a five-star hotel, the Chateau Lake Louise. It's a beautiful place to stay overlooking the lake and the mountains and the glaciers. Now, a very helpful way to visualize, literally visualize complex variables is to use the complex plane. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the Argand plane. Uh, it actually should be called the Casper Wessel plane, which is another story. You should, you should look that up and see why I say that. But anyway, so we'll call it the complex plane. And it's a way for us to visualize complex numbers and variables 
in a geometric way that will be very, very helpful for us. We can do it either in Cartesian coordinates, so x and y, where x is the real axis. So any real number is going to be along the x-axis. And then the y-axis is the imaginary axis. So a point z out here, so x plus i, y, well, that's a distance x and y. Uh, so that gives us the location of the point in the complex plane and gives a, us, again, a very clear way to geometrically interpret what a complex number or variable is representing. We can equally well and alternatively look at it in polar form, r theta. Uh, so here's our x real and y imaginary axis. r is the radial distance from the origin of our point z, and theta is the angle from the positive real axis to that radial line. So our theta, x, y equivalent representations of the same thing. It's just up to us as to which one is most convenient for the particular use that we have. And we can switch back and forth as necessary. Now the modulus of z is just the length of z as a vector. So it's the distance from the origin to the point z. So it's that distance r that is the modulus. We denote it using this notation. It's the same notation as the absolute value because in fact the absolute value of a real number is just a special case of the modulus of a complex number. So it's the square root of the sum of the squares of x and y because that gives us the distance and that's equal to r, the radial distance from the origin. Now this angle theta again is measured from the positive x-axis. That's called the argument of z. So whenever you hear the argument of z that's the that angle theta from the positive real axis. Now, as I said, we can go back and forth between Cartesian and polar coordinates using just these geometric relationships. X is r cosine theta, which you see here. r times cosine theta will give us this length, and r times sine theta will give us this length. So we can go back and forth between x and y, or r and theta. So there's various ways we can represent a complex variable. We can use the Cartesian form, z is x plus i, y, or we can use the polar form, r cosine theta plus i r sine theta, using the, the transformation that we had in the previous slide. As I'll show in a little bit, this can also be written more compactly as r e to the i theta. We'll see that in a moment. So then again, r is just the modulus of z, it's the distance from the origin to the point, and theta is the argument of z, the angle from the positive real axis to the radial line r. There is some different notation that you might see in uh, certain textbooks. So I will always write out cosine theta plus psi sine theta, but some authors get a little lazy because it happens a lot, and they'll write cis theta, cosine plus psi sine theta, or sometimes just the angle bracket uh, theta, and that represents this cosine theta plus psi sine theta. So if you see that notation, that's what it represents. Now one of the important things about complex variables that's going to be a little bit of a thorn on our side is that, that the argument of z is actually multi-valued. That means it, there's no single value of the argument of z. If I have a point on the complex plane and you ask what's the argument, well there's actually an infinity of answers to that question. Because while arg z is just theta, I can separate that out into what's called the principal argument, theta zero. So that's a number between, say, minus pi and pi, or zero and two pi. It's just some two pi range. And add to that then two k pi, where k is an integer. In other words, if I have a point in the z plane, I have a theta zero, okay, the angle from the positive real axis to that location. But I can go around two pi and another two pi and another two pi, and I end up at the same place. So theta is theta zero, the principal argument, plus two k pi. And so we're gonna have to keep that in mind and be aware of that and take that into account as necessary. Now the complex conjugate, if you have z is x plus i y, z bar is the complex conjugate of z, and that's just x minus i y. Or if you use r e to the i theta, then the complex conjugate is r e to the minus i theta. All you have to do is change all your i's to minus i's and you have the complex conjugate. <laughs> Sorry again. So this is that same location. The previous picture was taken from right here. You can see here 
The Chateau Lake Louise, beautiful five-star hotel built in the late 1800s by the Canadian Railroad, bringing people from the East Coast out here to this beautiful location. And again, you can see that it's overlooking the lake here as well as uh, the glaciers and the mountain. Beautiful, beautiful location. Again, sorry about that, I, it's a distraction. So as I said, the absolute value of a real number is simply just the special case of the modulus. Uh, polar coordinates is the 2D version of cylindrical coordinates. So don't be confused by that. Cylindrical is R theta Z, polar is R theta. So it's just the 2D version of cylindrical coordinates. As I said a moment ago, to get the complex conjugate of some complex expression, complicated expression, just take all your i's and change them to minus i's and you have the complex conjugate. Graphically, what that represents when you, is taking a reflection. So when you take the complex conjugate, you're just reflecting it about the x-axis because the y's become negative. For two complex numbers to be equal, you have to check that the real and the imaginary parts are the same. Now the symbol actually that we use, we often don't think about who thought of these, who came up with these, who standardized these. It was actually Leonard Euler who was the one who standardized this notation, I. Now for you electrical engineers, you're thinking, wait, what's this I? We use J. I hate to break it to you, but the rest of the world uses I for the imaginary number. You use J because I is the current. And so that's already used, so you had to use J. But the rest of us, we all use I. It was actually Gauss who came up with the term complex number. There's actually a really good book as well, An Imaginary Tale, The Story of Square to Minus One. It gives a historical account of the development of complex variable theory. And it's unique in the sense that it, while it focuses primarily on the history, it also gives the math. So it gives examples and shows how it was used originally in some algebraic factorizations and how it developed into what we know today as complex variable theory. So what we're going to do in the next several sections is we're going to have to basically rewind all the way back to grade school and redo arithmetic, algebra, trigonometry, and calculus in order to see how they're the same, hopefully the more the better, how they're the same and different from what we learned for real numbers, variables, and functions. So that's what we're going to do. Ah, sorry, one, one last photo here. So this is the Banff Springs Hotel. Uh, it's in Banff National Park just down the road from Chateau Lake Louise. And you can see it's, it looks like a castle. It's a beautiful hotel, again, five star. And the, the interesting thing about these is they're in the national park. In the states where I live, uh, the national parks generally do not have luxurious hotels. They tend to be very Spartan, very minimalistic. Uh, in the Canadian national parks, they have beautiful towns and beautiful hotels right in the park. All right, enough of an advertisement for uh, the Canadian Rockies.